Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to uh, present you here a uh, part of my work. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, I will talk about unstructured networks and additive noise. Uh, I've been working uh, for many years now on additive noise and this work uh, is very interesting for me because, uh, well, this is well known in some literature on coherence resonance, but you see uh, coherence by additive noise and I would like to show this. Um, so first I give a, a motivation of the work, then I uh, sketch the model, then I will discuss briefly uh, two cases, identical distributed noise and non-identically distributed noise, and then compare the results to experimental data. So um, everything started with an EEG that we were looking at uh, under isoflurane anesthesia. And this is data here provided by uh, Darren Hyde and Heiko Kaiser from Bern. And it's uh, EEG under surgery, so during surgery. And uh, when you take a closer look, this is a pr uh, frontal electrode. And when you take a closer look, then you, you see from time to time, there are some small intervals where you see uh, well-reduced activity reduced in uh, amplitude. And when you take a closer look, it's interesting to see and you compute the power spectrum, then you see that uh, these uh, small uh, short intervals uh, show uh, always the same frequency, in this case, eight hertz. And uh, the activity around these intervals uh, do not show that, that peak or not that strong peak. So this is more background activity, so the other uh, parts, but these short intermittent um, periods, you see this eight hertz frequency. And so the question is, where does this come from? So in under anesthesia, and we found that in several patients, and yeah, it looks like burst suppression, but it's not burst suppression. Uh, and so we were curious, so what is, what is this about? So where does this intermittent low amplitude activity come from? And so thinking about the brain, where this might come from, um, the EG is measured uh, or is originated in the cortex. And of course there are subcortical uh, areas and there's also importantly the reticular activating system. And it is well known that the reticular uh, activating system sets the level of excitation in the brain. So in our hypothesis is that, um, yeah, that this reticular activating system maybe uh, is, has some fluctuations and that these fluctuations represents uh, reductions, short reductions of external input to the cortex. So that is our model hypothesis. Um, because we know that reticular activating system excites uh, the cortex and especially under anesthesia, there are strong fluctuations of this level of excitation. So that's our working hypothesis. So uh, let's model the EG then in the cortex. Since um, we do not know exactly what is the what is the exact uh, structure of the underlying neural network. And you see these structures in the EEG, these small intermittent phases uh, in the back of the head. So in, in occipital uh, electrodes and frontal electrodes. So we, we're not sure where, where this comes from and how much the structure of the network comes into play. We just chose uh, unstructured networks and we're curious whether we can see something on in these networks. So we have uh, excitatory and inhibitory um, population. This is coupled together and these uh, populations are driven by noise. So at the end, we come up uh, with a very simple um, um, connectivity model, dynamical model, where the V and the W are the dendritic activity in the excitatory and inhibitory um, populations. So the F and the M are the connectivity matrices and the H, uh, the single node is a transfer function. Here for simplicity, we choose uh, McCulloch-Pitts neurons. So the transfer function 
is a step function. But this can be generalized, you will see in the, in the following, this can be generalized easily to other sigmoid functions. Just in this case, uh, it's simple to do analytical work, but nevertheless, this holds true um, for other models. In addition, we have uh, the noise terms here, the Xi n1 and Xi n2, and these are uncorrelated. So um, the noise uh, is Gaussian here, and we introduce here uh, noise classes. So the Xi n1 drives the excitatory population. These are noise processes that are uncorrelated, but maybe non-identically distributed, while the noise that drives the inhibitory population is uncorrelated and identically distributed. So, and uh, random processes, this is um, one of the major idea of the analysis here. Random processes can be captured together in certain noise classes, and these noise classes share uh, the variance in mean value. So that's quite simple, but this is quite helpful for the analytical treatment later on. In addition, we have the, um, a network, and here we took uh, Erdos Schröni um, network with a connectivity probability of 0.95, so it's a strongly connected uh, network, but um, other studies show that uh, the results hold also until uh, connectivity probability to 0.40. So below 0.40, um, it does not hold anymore. I can explain that later if you're interested uh, why this is the case. But the an analysis here um, has some assumptions. And one assumption is that it's homogeneous. So at each node, if you compute the mean connectivity at each node, this is a constant um, that's so, in other words, it's a homogeneous network. And the connectivity matrices, when you plot the correlation, um, matrix, uh, it's given here, it's shown here, and you see it's completely uncorrelated. So that's, that's important. Okay, in addition to learn more about uh, the network and what are the properties are, it's interesting to consider the kernel spectra. So you just compute the eigenvalue, the left-hand side Egan, eigenvalue spectrum, and there you see that there's a single um, maximum uh, eigenvalue and very small, uh, almost vanishing uh, other eigenvalues. And this single uh, maximum eigenvalue corresponds to the constant mode. So at the end, you can show um, analytically, um, and you see that also numerically, that the constant mode is the primary mode here, and we can reduce the dynamics to the primary mode, to the uh, constant mode. So, Let's start with the identically distributed noise. So everything's fine. So uh, the noise is uncorrelated and identically distributed. And uh, so the setting is here. It's a two-dimensional uh, arrangement. So I, stimul uh, I apply a stimulation on a circle. And here I show you, uh, show you the video. So the noise is increased. Uh, with time and you see here there's a, there are fluctuations here and there's there's a mean value of, of the field and after some time at a certain variance um, this drops so the mean value drops and goes to no uh, to a lower state and uh, yeah and at the end um, this new state uh, yeah it's a lower state and the task of the analysis is to analyze what is it all about? Why does it jump to a lower state? And what are the properties of this lower state? So the analysis, we say, okay, we have uh, dendritic activity V and W. Um, this is uh, at the end the sum of a, of a constant mode of a spatially constant V and plus fluctuations, the same for W. And then we apply a mean field, uh, we do a mean field analysis and find these coupling equations here with mu. So this is almost the same as before. Now with constant uh, constants f and m, and now with new sigmoid functions. I come to this in a moment. In addition, uh, the fluctuations obey your onstein uhlenbeck process and have a stationary probability density uh, that are Gaussians. 
So in uh, the underlying assumption here to derive this is that um, the expectation value of the random matrix entries, matrix entries, um, that the correlation, the expectation, no, no, put it the other way around, the expect, um, the um, matrix elements in uh, connectivity matrix elements are independent of the temporal fluctuations. Okay. So additive noise, huge transfer function. So the new transfer function that we get analytically looks like this. So where rho is the probability density function of the external fluctuations of the additive noise effect. Since these are Gaussians, these functions are very uh, simple to, to compute. And so we get uh, the, the well-known transfer function. This is a tangent pseudobolicus uh, here. And you see when you increase the noise level, then you flatten the sigmoid function. So um, with this, we have all ingredients. And uh, let's take a look at the time series of uh, the mean activity here. This is uh, V for low noise and for high noise. When you compute the power spectrum of the mean field, you see that there's a peak for high noise in the power spectrum and a peak for the phase coherence. So um, the additive noise induces um, a coher more coherent structure than before with a stronger power at a certain frequency. When we do the, uh, the analysis, nonlinear analysis of our mean field equation, we see exactly this, that we have in the beginning at low noise, we have a stable node and increasing the noise, there's a settled node bifurcation to a lower uh, activity state to a stable focus and uh, the frequency of this stable focus fits very well to the uh, to the frequency of the power uh, spec to the power peak spectrum and the phase coherence peak. So this uh, shows uh, quite good opponents. In addition, there's a link, of course, to coherence resonance. Just recall coherence resonance um, um, occurs if uh, you increase the noise in a system, then um, at a certain intermediate noise level, you find a certain a uh, peak, a power peak in a certain uh, frequency. And when you further increase the noise, then this vanishes again. This is exactly what we see here. You see from top to bottom, we increase the, uh, the noise level. So these are simulations of our model. And you see here, there comes up a peak at a certain frequency and this vanishes for large noise le um, levels. So we do, we can apply a linear, um, linear analysis, compute linearly the power spectrum at the stationary state. And at the end, we get this expression. And at the end, we can compute the power spectrum. And we, uh, we have a description of the coherence resonance effect here, um, subject to the noise. So now let's go, let's take a look at the non-identically distributed noise. So this is a bit uh, more complex. So. Um, the noise that drives the excited population is now non-identically distributed. And we have two noise processes. One noise, one part of um, the nodes receive um, noise with a certain Gaussian noise with a certain uh, variance and the, um, the mean value delta mu. And the other half of the nodes um, receive an external uh, additive noise with mean, where the noise process has a mean minus delta mu. So this is a uh, better scene. So these are examples of noise processes. So by I, you do not see much difference. You just see here something's different, but uh, it's not obvious. But if you plot the probability density, stationary probability density of uh, the noise processes, then you see uh, clearly what's going on. So, uh, well, delta mu is zero. So this is uh, identically distributed uh, noise process. Then you see a single peak, of course. And now um, you see two peaks. So at minus delta mu and uh, minus delta mu and plus delta mu. So this is the new probability density function. And then, of course, we can compute the transfer function because these depend on the probability density function. And uh, this is no sigmoid anymore. So now this is a 
such a still homogeneously uh, increasing, uh, continuously increasing function, but no sigmoid anymore. And this change of shape affects, of course, uh, the dynamics. So um, let's take a look at the simulation. So what I do here again is um, I increase with time the heterogeneity, so the delta mu, after some time and see what's happening. So let's see. So we have uh, again the uh, fluctuations. So and you see a drop of mean activity here to a, to a low point. Still, still um, fluctuating, but the mean value is uh, is lower. So when you compute the power spectrum and the phase coherence, you see the same. You see a peak here at a certain frequency for heterogeneity level and for the phase coherence. So we find a more coherent. Uh, lower state with a strong heterogeneity uh, in the in the fluctuations. Uh, the corresponding analytical work shows uh, shows good accordance to this. So we have in the beginning a stable node for small delta mu, and then at a certain critical heterogeneity, um, this state jumps to a low state and uh, fluctuates there. So, and this is the, the more coherent state here below and the upper state is less coherent. And in addition, of course, you can uh, compute the eigenvalues of, of the stationary state and you can describe quite well this frequency here where the phase coherence and power spectrum peaks by the analytical uh, study. So at the end, there's also a coherence resonance. You see a similar effect. So, on the left hand side, you see the simulation uh, where delta mu, the heterogeneity increases from top to bottom. You see that at a certain point of heterogeneity, you see uh, this peak emerging that vanishes after too strong heterogeneity. And uh, in addition, this corresponds uh, qualitatively to our linear analysis at the stationary state. So now at the end, the motivation, uh, since the motivation was uh, the EG, let's go back to the EG and describe um, this jump from an upper state to a lower state, because this is exactly what, what I described now, is exactly what we found in EG when you that you remember. So we have a jump to another state that suddenly has a certain frequency, a prominent frequency, and before you did not have this frequency. And the question was, where does this come from? So, and to model the, um, the EEG, so we extend a little bit uh, our analysis, our model. So the external driving of the excitatory input is not a constant anymore, but now we add some fluctuations. And these are global fluctuations with a strength A. So this is a noise strength. And, but nevertheless, we have one input parameter I0. This sets the constant input from outside, then we have the eta or the a as, a, as the strength of um, global fluctuations and of course the uncorrelated noise from outside. So in what I do is now um, I show you this here. So for the beginning, uh, I choose a high noise, noise level. Then you see uh, the fluctuations here, the simulated EEG here. Then um, I drop these three values. So at the end, reduce the input probably from the reticular activating system to the cortex. And suddenly you, you see these, uh, this small interval, a low, um, low amplitude oscillation. When you compute the power spectrum of these simulations here, then you see that in fact, you see this peak here at seven Hertz, while before and after you have this, um, this power spectrum that does not show the peak. And at the end in the bifurcation diagram of the stationary state, what is done here is that you start at, at a high, uh, high input level, this is here, and at the end I jump, I jump here to get the low amplitude interval and then I go back. And I'll show you a simulation of this. So what I do here, as I said, uh, I simulate for, for a certain amount of time uh, the high noise activity and then suddenly the input drops is reduced by the reticular activating system, then you see this new state um, with a coherent, this new coherent state with a certain frequency. 
that it's not visible here in the simulation, but when you compute the power spectrum, it's, um, it's confirmed that it's, that it's there. And so that's uh, an interesting result for us because we are, uh, we are working on anesthesia and, and the effect of uh, anesthetic drugs on the EEG. And uh, it's interesting to see that just by that just this small interval can be explained, this small low amplitude uh, interval can be explained by a reduction of input. And uh, this might be the reticular activating system what makes uh, completely sense to us. So at the end, um, I showed uh, a state transition from a non-synchronized state to a synchronized state by additive noise. And this jump is uh, in addition a jump from non-oscillatory state to an oscillatory state by additive noise, what at the first glance is uh, counterintuitive, but as coherence resonance is, uh, this is the, the same idea. Um, this is an amazing property of the non uh, of the system and the nonlinearity and the bistability of the system plays an important role here. So uh, we provided an uh, analytical description of the noise induced transitions, and that is also important. And uh, that's also interesting for the case of coherence resonance because it's rather um, rather straightforward to compute the power spectra and show the, um, analytically the correct power spectrum. Um, there's, a, as I said, a, a similarity to the uh, coherence resonance, and we explain the burst suppression-like phenomenon in EEG just by reduced, reduced input. And I would like to um, add, in addition, I did not mention this here again, but, uh, but we showed a coherence resonance by heterogeneity. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, I've not found that before, so uh, it's well known that uh, increasing noise induces uh, coherence resonance. It's well possible that I that I've not seen any by accident, did not see any paper, but uh, I had a hard time to find uh, any paper showing coherence resonance by heterogeneity. And we have also uh, an analytical description of this effect. So what we want to do in, a, um, in future work is uh, we aim to do a, a mathematical analysis of spatially constrained noise input. Now um, with uh, the full field is uh, receives input from outside, additive noise from outside, but it's interesting to see what changes if the stimulation is locally, uh, is localized. In addition, uh, we want to consider more general network topologies. So here we have the uh, the Schrönes uh, Reni network, but of course, scale-free networks uh, are um, more obvious or more more realistic in in the brain. And so we will we will focus on that maybe in the future work and see whether we can still apply our our method. Then it's more realistic. And in addition, I, I would like to mention a work that we currently do is uh, we ask a slightly different question. So uh, we've, we've seen that in a simulation of a neural network, we found that uh, we find uh, synchronized activity uh, when we increase the, the external, uh, internal excitation that's well that's uh, well known so we call this a seizure but now we study the effect analytically the effect of external driving or external additive input to the system and we can show also analytically and in numerical simulations that this destroys the seizure and this is uh, very interesting for us because uh, we started working on uh, uh, transcranial um, magnetic simulation and electrical stimulation and analyzed data and did already some work on that. And um, this is also related to deep brain simulation where, uh, for instance, in Parkinson patients, you want to destroy the, uh, the pathological 13 Hertz rhythm by uh, a high frequency external stimulation. And this also kills the, the seizure or the tremor. And, and so this is also a possible application of our work here. And um, 
as I said, one aim is to provide an analytical description of this. And for the, for the stimulation types that I show you here for pulsatiles, pulsatile input and for noise and for periodic activity, we already have the analytical description and can describe and understand quite well what's going on here. So here I give some, some references of the work and very important, would like to thank very much uh, Darren Haidt and uh, Heiko Kaiser from the Insel Sp uh, Spital in Bern who provide the data and my longtime collaboration partner, uh, Jeremy Lefebvre uh, from the University of Ottawa. Thank you for your attention. That's great. Thanks very much, Axel. So the uh, top question here actually came in just before your last slide um, from Priscilla Greenwood, who asked if this applied to epileptic seizures. So I think that's been um, answered on that last slide there. Yeah. So um, the next question was from Etienne Tanray, who said, Hi, Axel. Thank you for your very nice talk. I was wondering how you deal with your heavy sight function and the white noise. Do you have to take into account the local time at the discontinuity? So, so at the, is it at the analytical? Let's see. With the discontinuity of the heavy side. Well, the key, the key idea is, uh, well, when I simulate, of course, well, there's no problem at all numerically, but analytically, um, this is the key, uh, the key formulation here. So you have an integral over the heavy side uh, convolved with a with a Gaussian distribution, and this gives you then the, the smooth transfer function. So analytically, there's no there's no point. And numerically, I do not see, yeah, I do, I do not see any, any problems here. Of course, you have to think about how you implement a heavy side function, but, uh, but it worked quite well. And I tested everything. Uh, I computed the statistics uh, also uh, and, and my simulations, and they uh, had showed a very good agreement with the analytical result. Okay. And there's another question here from Dmitry Todorov, who asks, how, how specific do you think it is to anesthesia, i.e. do you have a wild guess of where else this could be relevant? Yeah, well, well as I said, uh, well, we, um, we work now on, on TMS and TES, so that's an application of that approach. Well, the, the, effect, the effect that I see here um, is, uh, was stimulated by the anesthesia uh, data. Um, yeah, but otherwise I'm, yeah, I do not see, I do not see any further application here, but, but we are strongly, as I said, uh, we are strongly working on this TMS or extra cranial, cranial uh, stimulation uh, work and this is really promising because it, this might be a way to describe analytically deep brain simulation and TMS and TES. So that's a major application. Great. Okay, so I think one question just came in there um, from Andre Longton, but we don't have time to ask it live. So if you want to respond to that question in the Q and A um, during the next talk.